Peter Jeffries um, writes in the area of sexual politics, international gender politics and lesbian and gay politics. She's written 12 books on the history of politics and sexuality. Originally from the UK, Sheila moved to Melbourne in 1992 to take up a position at the University of Melbourne. She retired back to the UK in 2015 and since then has been actively involved in feminist and lesbian feminist politics, particularly around the issue of sexual violence. Um, and recently has is a director and a, a founder of the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights and a co-author of that declaration, which challenges uh, the threats posed by gender identity ideology to women's rights. Um, Sheila Jeffrey's most recent book, Penile Imperialism, is published by Spinifex Press. Thank you so much, Sheila, and over to you. The Rise of Kink normalizing sexual violence. And in the book, two of the chapters are concerned with transvestism, the fetish behavior in which men adopt what they see as women's clothing, behavior and body parts for the purposes of masochistic sexual satisfaction. So I think it's reasonable to say that transvestism is a variety of sadomasochist behavior, though it's not the form of sadomasochist behavior that I will be talking about today. In the book, I try to embed transvestism into a historical understanding of how a variety of what were once called men's sexual perversions and are now more commonly called paraphilias or kink were normalized and brought out into public space in the period after the so-called sexual revolution in the 1960s and 70s. This chapter I'm talking about today is preceded, preceded by one on paedophilia. It, also, it contains a consideration of nappy fetishism, which I've talked to you all about before, so I'm not going to deal with that today. Now, the predilection for sexual practice in which one person inflicts physical or psychological violence on another was, before the sexual revolution, routinely regarded by the sexological profession as a paraphilia, a mental health problem. From the 1970s onwards, a campaign which originated in San Francisco, the city at the heart of gay liberation, sought to normalize sexual violence under the name sadomasochism as an important component of what I call the male sex right in the book. It's now generally included under the umbrella term BDSM, bondage, discipline and sadomasochism, or simply kink. The campaign took a similar form to those which were carried out on behalf of other uh, paraphilias such as transvestism, paedophilia, nappy fetishism and so on. The proponents, who were mostly male, sought to promote and normalize their practice through support groups, conventions, fairs, public display. They sought as a most important facet of their campaign to change the psychiatric diagnosis of their practice so that it was seen as an ordinary form of sex rather than connected in any way with mental illness. This they achieved, as we shall see. They moved on to campaigning to change the law so that their practice could not be seen as criminal and to prevent discrimination over matters such as child custody. And in this latter respect, they've not yet been completely successful. The normalization of sadomasochism has a very harmful impact on women's health, safety and rights, because in heterosexual relationships, the victims of the practice are overwhelmingly women and they experience violence and control. It affects women's legal rights to be free from sexual violence because the campaign to change the law, to recognize the possibility of consent to very considerable harm, threatens women's right to the law's protection against violence. It's also a very serious problem because it has considerable effects upon women's experience of sex as the practices of anal sex, strangulation, and many other practices of violence have become common elements of everyday sex. It is not, as practitioners commonly argue, 
a matter of privacy and personal life with no political significance. It is very political indeed, being the enacting in brutally clear forms, the power relations of male domination for sexual excitement. Now, historically, if we look back, we can see that BDSM has not always been the respectable practice that it is today. It has a history, and I'll say a bit about the history here. Back in the 1980s, radical and revolutionary feminists in the UK were writing about and campaigning for a sexuality of equality. We understood that men's sexual violence against women could not be brought to an end, whilst women's subordination was seen as sexy, and whilst eroticized inequality was the main form of sexual activity and pleasure under male domination. We said that there had to be a sexuality of equality if women were to be free. So when what was called lesbian sadomasochism was introduced to the UK from California around 1980, and SM dykes, as they called themselves, began to campaign for the normalization of their practice, we set up in London a group called Lesbians Against Sadomasochism, and we opposed them. We lost. From then on, sadomasochism became triumphant, and the ideas and practices were disseminated into heterosexual culture, so that today health magazines give advice to men on how to strangle women safely. That's where we are today. Now, often the first thing that proponents of sadomasochism will say in their defense is that sadomasochism is nothing to do with feminism or politics because women do it too. In fact, sadomasochism is the only paraphilia in which women are involved in any serious way. Women's sexuality though, is socially constructed from a position of, of subordination and not domination. So women's involvement in any of the practices that are overwhelmingly promoted and engaged in by men is likely to represent the considerable differences that inevitably derive from women's subordinate status. The practice of sadomasochism is not as it is generally made out to be, simply an issue of the sexual freedom of equal adults, but consists of the acting out of the sexual dynamics of male domination. Men dominating, being violent towards and humiliating women is overwhelmingly the main way in which it takes place. A minority of, of men desire to play submissive roles but they cannot usually coax or force their female partners to play the role of dominance. So they repair to prostituted women who work as dominatrixes. Being submissive is dangerous for women as it can involve serious injury or even death. But when men play at this role with prostituted women, they're in little danger because they are, they are paying and they're in charge. Research on the role of women in BDSM, and there really isn't very much, found that men are generally the initiators of the practice and that women will usually engage only to please a partner. Women involved in the SM culture overwhelmingly prefer to engage in a submissive role. Homosexual men follow the pattern of women involved in the practice in preferring submissive roles. Now, the, to look at the history for a moment, the campaign to normalize sadomasochism began in the city, which was at the heart of gay male culture in the US, San Francisco. The promotion of sadomasochism was a prime feature of the sexual liberation of gay men that took place in the 1970s. San Francisco gained a reputation as a center for leather bars, and sadomasochist sex clubs for gay men, which had rooms for private sex. When many of these facilities began to close under the pressure of the HIV epidemic in the early 80s, some activists decided to stage the Folsom Street Festival, at which half-naked men would be tied to posts and flogged on the public street, and stalls sold fetish equipment. More than 400,000 people attend this celebration of violent sex yearly 
and the profits go into the local gay sex industry. Some lesbians in, in San Francisco began to take part in local sadomasochist and leather groups and the campaigning organization SAMWA was founded in the city in 1979 to promote the practice as healthy, positive and feminist. Their publications and ideas led to the setting up of SM Dyke groups in other countries. The promotion of sadomasochism was always political and aimed at normalizing the practice and spreading its ideas. Gay and lesbian sadomasochists wore their regalia of black leather, straps, chaps, often including Nazi accoutrements such as swastikas and SS caps in public and in the London lesbian and feminist community to meetings and places of entertainment, to parades and at fairs and festivals. There was nothing private about the practice. It was out and unfortunately proud. As the practitioners sought to promote sadomasochism in feminist and lesbian communities, newsletters and events in the 1980s, a furious opposition was created from feminists involved in campaigns against male violence and pornography who aimed to create a sexuality of equality to further women's liberation, not a formalized eroticizing of women's subordination. In the US and the UK throughout the 1980s, feminist opposition was fierce through publications, meetings, conferences. The ideological struggle between the lesbians who sought to normalize sadomasochism and the feminists who fought this was called by commentators the feminist sex wars. The feminist opposition gained some considerable traction, but by the end of the decade, the feminist defense of an equal sexuality was trounced, mainly because of the enthusiasm of gay male and left media for sadomasochism. The forces in defense of the dominant submissive sexuality of male domination were too strong. The main campaigning organization now for sadomasochism is the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom in the US, which was formed in 1997. And it is powered by various aspects of the sex industry. It's a coalition of almost a hundred groups, which include a broad range of sex industry companies. Its goal is to fight for sexual freedom and privacy rights for all adults who engage in what they call safe, sane, and consensual behavior. The campaigners were invited by the American Psychological Association, which publishes the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, or DSM, to give evidence as to why there should be a change in classification of this form of sexual violence. In the 2013 DSM-5, sexual sadism disorder remained, i.e causing pain, humiliation, fear, or some form of physical or mental harm to another person to achieve sexual gratification without the consent of the victim. But what was seen as consensual sadomasochism was removed from the DSM. The transformation in the way sadomasochism is understood as a result of the normalization campaign was extraordinary. It was transformed from a risky form of sexually violent behavior to its opposite, that is therapy. This is an example of what the US radical feminist philosopher Mary Daly called patriarchal reversal. Daly saw patriarchal ideology as based upon a reversal, which is a form of double think in which the victims are, for instance, blamed for the behavior of the perpetrators, or in this case, simply upturning a practice of male violence and giving it an opposite and positive interpretation. The campaign also included attempts to liberalize law and policy on sadomasochism, which have been less successful as we shall see. I now want to look at the idea of consent in sadomasochism. The normalization of sadomasochism required that the practice be seen as consensual. And I say a great deal more in my book earlier about the nonsense of consent, um, which is of course a way of gaining access to the bodies of women by men in a relationship of power. 
I mean, you don't really have, men don't have to consent to sexual practices that women wish to do upon them. And of course, the relations between men and women are unequal. But I don't want to go into that sort of back story of consent here. Um, the social and legal acceptability of sadomasochism depends on the notion of consent, because that is all that can distinguish it from other forms of violence. There is therefore a great deal of discussion within the BDSM community, as well as among ethicists and sexologists about the limits of consent. None of the discussion acknowledges that there is a power dynamic of male domination and women's subordination already at work in heterosexual relationships before it is added to by sadomasochism. A complete equality of women and men is assumed in the discussions on consent. And of course, women are nowhere near being in a situation of equality. The concept of consent is prominently and continuously spruiked as the magic ingredient of the practice. As one researcher puts it in her study of how consent works in sadomasochism or rather in BDSM practice, she says, consent is the sine qua known of BDSM practice. Along with trust and risk, consent forms part of a triptych which marks BDSM practice as an expression of desire and distinguishes it from criminal acts. The main problem, of course, with consent in relation to sadomasochism is that the violation of consent can be precisely what makes the practice exciting in the first place. For instance, a so-called sex coach interviewed by the BBC, explained it this way. For some people saying no, but not being listened to may be part of the sexual practice. But this was okay because you've negotiated this ahead of time. So the dominant knows that's part of your cathartic pleasure. That is not having consent. The study of SM uh, consent explains that the very purpose of BDSM practice can be for the sadist to take the masochist as far as they said they want to go and a little bit further. So that consent becomes an absolute nonsense when violating it is what the excitement is about. Despite these difficulties, even in situations that include death, some BDSM activists will argue that consent should be seen as a defense. One researcher discusses the ethical dilemma created by someone who seeks out their own death. In an article titled, On the Limits of Sexual Ethics, the phenomenology of auto-assassinophilia, auto-assassinophilia. The dilemma she discusses is whether the mantra of consent covers this issue. And the main case she discusses is that of Sharon Lopatka, who initiated her own murder on an internet website dedicated to those expressing fantasies of being killed and those interested in doing the killing. Lopatka met a man online who murdered her during sexual activity. He was in fact convicted and imprisoned. As the Downing puts it, this demonstrates that the phenomenon of being murdered for pleasure problematizes commonplace assumptions about the legitimacy to consent. The dilemma as to the extent of his, his culpability, however, split the BDSM community between those who considered that consent trumped everything and those who believed that there should be limits. Now, the uh, advocates of BDSM use another way to try and massage their rep the reputation of their practice, which is the argument that it can be made safe. And they put a great deal of energy into creating safety codes in formational materials and guides to different practices. It is of course hard to make physical assault safe, especially when the point of the practice is to be dangerous. Many of the practices can cause very serious problems to health and some like breath play or strangulation kill. There are instructions on one advice site about how to do breath play and anal play. <laughs> 
how to use handcuffs and how to do bondage. Apparently, for instance, bondage, uh, bandage scissors are useful if someone needs to be cut loose in a hurry. So there are things you need to have around when you do this practice. There's advice on which bits of the body can be safely attacked and when paddling or spanking, the perpetrators are advised to be careful where you hit. Breasts are okay, but not kidneys, lower back and neck. It advises not to hit people in the face or neck with objects and not to target joints, which are surprisingly fragile. Of course, the practices cannot be made safe when they consist of creating injuries. But the positive coverage of BDSM in women's magazines and on health and psychology websites suggests that they can be not only safe, but even the safest form of sex to be involved in. An article in Women's Health magazine offering a guide to BDSM entitled A Beginner's Guide with Tips by a Sex Therapist is subtitled, who, by the way, says it's the safest kind of sex you can have. Right? So creating de deliberate injury is the safest kind of sex you can have, says Women's Health magazine. Now, the severity of the injuries that are inflicted can make it hard for the practitioners to get medical care when they need it. And there's a fascinating article in the Journal of Sexual Medicine discussing the healthcare needs of BDSM practitioners in San Francisco. Many or uh, 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 most of those in this article are lesbians. And the article gives a lot of information about what they're doing. The participants in the study engaged in practices that meant they sometimes needed to go to doctors to deal with the injuries they received, such as kink practices that had the potential to lead to physical injury, most commonly bruising or open wounds from practices such as whipping, flogging or sex toy use, etc. The practitioners also risked being infected with diseases such as HIV and hepatitis B and C because of the exchange of body fluids. Examples that participants gave of the injuries that caused them to seek medical help or advice give a useful picture of the activities that were routinely part of their practice. One 53 year old woman said, a possible injury that she might need help with was a torn rotator cuff that's in the shoulder from too much flogging. And other problems were extensive bruising. A pregnant woman wanted to know whether she could carry on being flogged and how hard and where on the body. Syndromasochist lifestyles could create problems for doctors because women may not be able to make medical decisions because they had husbands who were their masters in the speak of uh, sadomasochism and had complete control of their lives. So that was a problem that was being discussed in this article for doctors. The problem can experience, the women can experience extreme forms of what now tends to be called social control. So I'll go on to say a little more about social control. The use of social control is just one way in which BDSM follows the pattern of other forms of violence against women. This a practice of uh, coercive or controlling behavior is increasingly recognized by legislatures and as an important aspect of men's violence. When not justified by consent, this is now commonly seen as a serious form of male violence, even in the absence of physical assault. Coercive and controlling behavior is an integral part of the practice of BDSM. Humiliation, for instance, is de rigueur. It is manifest in the long-term abusive relationships that exist in BDSM communities, which have various descriptors such as master slaves or D stroke S, meaning dominant submissive in these relationships. The subordinates have many, if not most, of their freedoms removed, and their fi finances, movements, and decisions fall under the control of their master, 
Coercive and controlling behavior is understood legally to make it hard for the victim of abuse to assert themselves and to leave because of ongoing psychological control. I just want to say something about children in the homes of sadomasochists. One reason that sadomasochist practitioners are keen to make their practice look respectable is to persuade the courts that there should be no barrier to gaining child custody. The director of the um, National Council for Sexual Freedom explains that the parents may be committed members of a sadomasochist community and forced to hide their practice and refrain, refrain from accessing sex education or interacting with others who are kinky because of the risk of losing custody of their children. The kinky adults, of course, may practice whipping, beating, cutting, or bondage of women and coercive control in which their male partners must be addressed as master. And all of these practices, you might think, could train children to think that violence against the control of women are ordinary parts of life. Um, Lynn Hahn has researched the effects on children of living with violent fathers and points out there's overwhelming evidence that the children are distressed. Now, some children are not only forced to witness their fathers being violent, but may be required to be violent themselves towards their own mothers. In recent years, there have been a number of news reports that suggest the ill effects suffered by children who grow up with sadomasochism. One is the case of Barbie Kardashian. Kardashian is a young man from Ireland who was, uh, quote, born into a household of extreme depravity and domestic violence with, with parents who engaged in a sadomasochist relationship in he, which he was directed as a child to attack his mother. He's referred to in the media as she because he describes himself as transgender. He grew up with a desire to kill women and attempted to kill his female social worker while traveling in a car with her, but she managed to survive. He repeatedly told the woman, I'm going to kill you, whilst trying to gouge out her eyes. Um, he wrapped himself around the, her body, tore clumps of her hair out, bit her and clawed at her face, tearing her eyelids. He was arrested in September 2020 at the age of 19 for threatening to kill two people, one of whom was his mother, and sent to a women's prison because of his claims to be transgender despite a well-known and often stated desire to rape, torture, abuse, and kill women. So it does seem possible that one of the effects of growing up in a sadomasochist household might be that a child develops quite severe paraphilias of their own. Another issue which threatens the respectability of sadomasochism is the connection between women's involvement in the practice and their experience of previous sexual victimization. There's a considerable body of literature, of course, on the way in which women's experience of childhood sexual violence from men can make them predisposed to risky sexual behavior, including sadomasochism. But the implication that childhood sexual violence could create a vulnerability to participating in, in sadomasochism infuriates the proponents of the practice. Rather than predisposing victims to engage in sadomasochism, they say, Sadomasochism offers an important salve, a way of healing from the trauma they have suffered. A piece in the online magazine Swaddle, for instance, explains that kink is innate, not acquired, and so it cannot be connected with abuse at all. In fact, the piece tells us BDSM can be a form of therapy for those traumatized by past abuse. They can, for instance, engage in trauma play, where they play with their trauma or abuse. It's also argued by some practitioners that acting out racist violence and abuse is healing for black people. A black woman speaker at the Out Sex New York conference in 2018, for instance, explained how race play works. She says it heals people from the traumatic racism they have experienced and consists of the reenactment and staging of oppressive racist relations in a sexual contact context. And it's the most taboo of all taboos, the edgy of edge play, and incorporates settings, roles, races, slurs, and practices intertwining race, sex, and sexuality. Uh, for instance, it can be based on uh, World War II atrocities, Holocaust victims, and Nazis, um, and so on. Now, I remember when I used to give talks against Sedomazgan back in the 1980s, sometimes lesbians would tell me that Sedomazgan was good for them, because it allowed them to heal from their sexual abuse in childhood. I always used to reply that repetition, however, is not the same as healing. It, it just recycles the abuse. 
Now, one of the things that the PDSM proponents dearly want is to have um, the right to consent to extreme practices of sadomasochism to be recognized in law so that their practice cannot be um, seen as criminal. Um, and there's a, a, a great deal more that I can say about this, but I think I'm not quite going to have time to do that. But let it be said that a few years back, um, 20 years or so back, in fact, uh, there was an attempt to get consent to the practices of sadomasochism put into law. It was going through pretty much. It was recommended. Um, then the feminists found out about it and feminists involved in fighting male violence set up a huge campaign saying it would in, be enormously dangerous to women if consent to very violent, very dangerous practices was in the law because the men would say that the women uh, uh, consented and it would be impossible to um, to prosecute the men successfully. So in that sense, if in no other, uh, sadomasochist demands, um, the demands of their activism are very, very dangerous to women's interests indeed. Now the, the most dangerous form of sadomasochist practice for women's lives is breath play or strangulation. It's called breath play. And out of it comes um, or it's com uh, a defense that is commonly used by men when they actually murder women by strangulation. And they call it the sex game gone wrong. Uh, breath play can include asphyxiation or suffocation, using a hood or other object, as well as choking and strangulation. And it's accepted as uh, just an adventurous form of sex. And de this is demonstrated by the huge number of articles on how to do it in women's mag magazines. We could not have imagined this back in the 1970s when a woman's right to a self-defined sexuality was seen as one of the demands of the women's liberation movement in Britain. We never could have imagined that that could include strangulation or the risk of death, and of course it cannot. So we have come a long way. There's an article in Women's Health about the practice, and it explains that less dangerous forms of BDSM may lose their appeal, so that players can ratchet up their repertoire with choking. And it says, if blindfolds and role play have veered into vanilla territory for you and your partner, there are still plenty of sex moves that are considered extra freaky, like choking. Sure, it sounds intense, but experimenting with breath control or scarfing, using a scarf to constrict breathing, can be an exhilarating experience for some people. The article's called Choking as a sex move, is it for you? And it says that many readers love it. And it says, having a man's hands round your neck plays into the fantasy of being taken, also known as ravishment. You feel you have an erotic power over him and your dopamine receptors are firing on all cylinders. In fact, of course, a woman who is being strangled has very little power indeed. When fatalities occur, as they increasingly do in this practice, the sex game gone wrong defense is utilized. Now, it's not possible today to describe in any detail the many other emerging forms of men's fetishism that are normalized in the present, but there are many others which have harmful effects upon women and children, many of which are related to transvestism, which I examine in, in the, the two chapters after this one in the book. And of course, there's many that are not included in the book because I simply didn't have space. Okay, so um, that's it for today, folks. Folks, I, I hope you will not be too depressed by this and will still be interested in reading the book at some time. One of the things I talk about in the book is the way that as feminists, as women, we're supposed to see all the different forms of male violence as somehow separate. What's happening in a woman's bedroom where she can't say no to a practice that makes her feel humiliated is seen as uh, quite different from a man dressed up as a woman somewhere or whatever. And all the different practices seem different. Sexual harassment is seen as different from other practices of violence and so on. And I explain that the feminist message has always been that we need to correct everything 
And so what I try to do the book is put all of those things together so that women can't just think, you know, mine must be my fault. You know, I, I did this or I did that or I did something else, because actually all of the practices that are going on that are distressing them are taking many forms and they need to be understood in concert, I think, so that women can understand the politics of their experience and so that we can fight those policies. We should, it, basically, we have to demand changes to male sexuality. We need sex education in schools, which actually tells boys they can't be masculine. There is no such thing as masculinity, makes them gentle, pleasant, and okay to be in a room with, and totally transforms what we're expecting of boys and men, for instance. I mean, that's just one example. But we have to transform, we have to get rid of pornography, get rid of the, the institution of prostitution. All of those things that construct aggressive male sexuality have to go. The whole thing has to be changed so that any woman can feel safe walking down the street, safe even thinking of entering a, a relationship with men, I think don't do it. But you know, mm -hmm. even if they do, and for young girls in particular, they need to be safe. So for any of that to happen, we have to bring down the whole structure, the whole structure. And so I try to give just a small snapshot really of that structure. I mean, there's quite a bit in the book, but there's so much I never got around to, for instance. 